All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Orr, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And uh, thanks to all of you in the audience whom I wish I could see, but uh, this is the world we live in now. Um, I want to invite uh, anyone in the audience to uh, interrupt with questions as we go. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, things I say will be, will be clear. Um, so uh, my talk is about mapping neural information flow using molecular fMRI. And um, uh, I want to begin with uh, this uh, cute uh, piece of art, actually, from uh, the early 20th century, which um, diagrams uh, a way of viewing the brain that I think is not uh, as popular today as it uh, you know, once was. Uh, you know, these days, we like to think of our brains as kind of the origins of uh, 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 you know, who we are, our, our tremendous cognitive capabilities, uh, uh, the things that dispose us towards creativity, that give us intelligence, that uh, may uh, also turn us into uh, criminals or people with mental illness. Um, but at the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the brain is actually not just who we are. It's actually a complicated device uh, for relating the input that comes in from our outside world to the output uh, that, we, that we express through our behavior or through things we say and do. And um, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the uh, process of figuring out how input uh, comes into our brains, gets transformed uh, by the processes in our brain uh, and uh, turns into behavior is really at the core of what neuroscience aims to do. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, although this, this is a, a, a figure from, from 1939 by this artist Fritz Kahn, uh, even in today's day, uh, you know, we, we still struggle uh, to uh, draw the causal loop between what we see, you know, this car out here and uh, what we do, uh, saying the word car back out. And uh, 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 Kahn's view of the various processes that took place in the head to allow this to take place um, of course, is utterly fantastical. We know a lot more about how uh, the sensory information gets transformed into uh, a vocalization and then uh, outputted through this uh, organ over here. Um, we know a lot more about how that really takes place in the head than uh, what this figure uh, declaims. Uh, but we're still missing uh, key aspects of it. Now, it's very tempting to fantasize about what goes on in the head. And you know, some of you may have seen, for instance, the Disney movie Inside Out that uh, shows cartoon characters living in our heads and doing the same kinds of things that are going on in this picture here. Um, we were blessed uh, with the discovery, the invention of functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, in the early 90s, uh, in large part due to work uh, here, uh, metaphorically here at the Martino Center. Um, and this kind of technique gives us this unbelievable look inside the living head, inside the living brain of actual people. Um, and we can see, uh, you know, areas of the brain that light up when certain stimuli are pre presented, when people engage in certain tasks. Um, but in some ways, the ability to identify these functional responses, like the one shown here, um, actually still fail to address the fundamental question I highlighted in the previous slide, namely, how does the outside world get into our heads, prompt us to do things, and then ultimately elicit behavior? And uh, you know, in particular, when we look at functional responses using fMRI, well, what we're often missing is information about the inputs and outputs associated with the activated areas. Something happened here. How did it come about? Where is it going? In addition, we don't know about the underlying molecular and cellular events that are going on in this place uh, and that may have uh, uh, been caused by uh, inputs uh, to the region here. And so um, although we have you know, increasing rec recourse uh, to techniques that are invasive, that can be used in animals to address some of these questions, at a whole brain level, uh, these types of questions are still, for the most part, out of reach. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is our lab's efforts to try to sort of scratch at the surface of these kinds of questions by uh, introducing and using uh, new molecular and cellular 
uh, technologies uh, that we can apply at a whole brain scale or at least a wide field scale to study uh, the processes of information uh, 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 flow through the brain and the underlying events that give rise to these changes. So um, the technique uh, that we've worked on over the past uh, you know, roughly 15 years in my lab is called molecular fMRI. And the idea is that it uses molecular imaging agents or MRI probes that sense cellular function in the nervous system. And because these probes are detectable by MRI, they allow us to combine wide field coverage of MRI with molecular precision for studies of integrated brain function, for looking at these questions of how information flows uh, through the brain and gets transformed at specific steps in neural processing. Uh, now, um, my talk today is going to look at two specific applications um, of uh, our molecular fMRI technology. The first is to dopamine release um, and the local and global consequences of dopamine. So it's looking at a specific step in neural information flow and uh, 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 synaptic communication uh, involved in reward learning. And then the second part of my talk will discuss information flow in reward-related circuitry. And I'll introduce to you a new uh, type of uh, molecular tool uh, that we've created that uh, we think uh, addresses, uh, allows us to look at uh, uh, circuit-specific processes in the brain. Um, now, uh, an important caveat to my whole talk, by the way, is that um, by using these tools, uh, we are uh, mostly limited uh, to small animals. This is something that we're uh, fighting against, uh, but you'll see that uh, the, the brain mapping, the mapping of information flow that I'll tell you about is, uh, mostly, is mostly in rodents today. All right, so let me start by talking about dopamine release and its local and global consequences. This is a, a, a project that we undertook using an MRI probe for sensing dopamine. Uh, that we developed uh, over uh, a considerable period of time uh, in work initially published by uh, Mikhail Shapiro, Gil Vestmeyer in my lab, and others, and then continued by, uh, uh, by others. Um, and we're looking at uh, into the heart of the dopamine sensor uh, that, uh, that we created. Um, it's a paramagnetic protein. So it's an MRI contrast agent because of this iron atom that sits in its heart um, in, in the context of a heme complex that's uh, uh, constitutively attached to the protein. And uh, the heme is paramagnetic, so it acts as an MRI contrast agent, much like gadolidium uh, or manganese-based contrast agents. Um, and what's special about this probe is that it's engineered to bind dopamine right above the heme iron. The dopamine sticks over here, and in doing so, it prevents water molecules from accessing the iron, and it turns off the contrast agent because the contrast agent requires that interaction with water molecules to be active. So dopamine binding displaces water and turns off the agent uh, when we use it. Now, in our initial work uh, 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 to use this, uh, this probe for functional imaging, uh, functional imaging of dopamine, uh, we injected uh, the probe into the striatum of rats. Uh, so the striatum is the main target of dopamine release in the mammalian brain. And uh, you can see how uh, unamenable our experiments are to humans here, uh, in part through this, uh, this kind of dark shaft that penetrates uh, the, the rat's brain. Um, and this is due to a cannula, essentially an injection needle, uh, that uh, um, uh, disperses a contrast agent into the region that we want to deliver it. And so by doing the injection kind of slowly and, and, and over a long enough period, we can actually fill up most of this brain region here uh, with the contrast agent and uh, then do functional imaging of dopamine. Now, how is that done? Well, in this experiment, as you'll see in the continuing experiments that I'll tell you about, we used a, reward, uh, a rewarding stimulus, something called MFB stimulation or stimulation of the lateral hypothalamus 
This is a famous reward that rats love. They work forever uh, to get it, and it substitutes for natural rewards in the rat brain. We picked this stimulus because it's robust and because um, it, um, uh, it can be implemented very easily in anesthetized animals, which these experiments take place in. And we, we saw in our initial experiments that if we give these pulses, the red ticks here uh, in time, uh, of MFB stimulation that we could see these little dips in uh, the MRI signal recorded from this region over here. The MRI signal, again, is coming from that probe. And as I told you, when dopamine is released, it turns off the probe. So we expect to have a negative signal change when we uh, uh, detect dopamine. And we showed, again, uh, back in 2014, uh, that we could detect uh, you know, uh, pretty clear uh, mean responses using the probe called 9D7. Uh, to uh, uh, dopamine release triggered by uh, the uh, MFB stimulus. We did controls with uh, a protein that doesn't uh, sense dopamine, and we saw a mostly flat line. We did a bunch of other controls that are all described in that paper, and I won't go into them in any further detail. So the main uh, function of this work back in 2014 was to validate the technique using the probe for dopamine imaging. But that doesn't really answer important questions about what dopamine does in the brain, how we can use our ability to image over wide fields of view in the brain to study what dopamine is doing. And so um, this is a problem that was taken up by Nan Lee in my lab um, much more recently and published in a paper that came out earlier this year. And um, what Nan did was to integrate the dopamine imaging technique with uh, brain-wide uh, bold fMRI. Um, we did this in two forms. One is uh, we took concurrent images of uh, dopamine-dependent dopamine, dopamine molecular imaging using T1-weighted uh, uh, imaging uh, and bold fMRI using uh, T2-weighted acquisition. We did this using a multi-echo uh, pulse sequence. Uh, we also took parallel images because we determined that the presence of the contrast agent distorts the bold contrast locally. So I'm going to show you results from both parallel and concurrent uh, imaging of these two uh, uh, types of data. So uh, we can see um, if we look at raw T1 weighted images where the contrast agent goes in, we're still using this kind of somewhat unphotogenic uh, uh, injection of the uh, contrast agent into the striatum, but keep in mind that this is where uh, most of the dopamine is released, and that's why we want to do the mapping there. Um, then we got two types of functional imaging, as I said. T1-weighted functional imaging, where we can map the negative signal changes, the signal depressions coming, that are mediated by the contrast agent, and then uh, positive signal changes that come from the uh, bold, uh, bold contrast acquired at higher, higher echo time. So these uh, two uh, types of imaging uh, are part of the analysis that I'll now show you. We asked two questions uh, using this combined data. The two questions are basically, how does striatal dopamine release compare with local changes in bold? And then also, how does striatal dopamine release modulate long distance activity? How, how can, what can we say about what dopamine release in the striatum does to the rest of the brain and the, therefore ultimately to behavior? Um, so we, acquire, we uh, address the first of these questions, the question about local influences by uh, obtaining uh, three types of map. So the first is a map of dopamine release itself. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is uh, these three slices here. These are three slices of the brain at these coordinates uh, uh, in the rostro uh, caudal direction and just zoomed in on the striatal area that was filled by the contrast agent. That's outlined in blue here. And the color coding is showing the amplitude of dopamine release in units of micromolar. We described the process for obtaining this quantitative information in our earlier work and I won't go through it here, but please feel free to ask about it if you have questions. We also, so we acquired this profile of dopamine release. We also acquired a profile of striatal bold in the same regions here. And you can already see by comparing these two maps that the areas that seem to have peak dopamine release here, the brightest yellow here, 
don't line up that well with the areas that have the peak bold signal, which are the yellow areas here as well. And um, part of what that's telling us already is that the air is that uh, dopamine is not simply uh, causing the bold signal in this region of the brain. And um, that's a significant point, I think, in part because of all the efforts to try to interpret human fMRI results that are obtained in the striatum. What do they mean? Do they mean dopamine release? Well, this argues no. Now, the third type of map we got is a difference map. It's the bold fMRI map uh, in the presence of uh, dopamine inhibitor, dopamine receptor inhibition, uh, minus the uh, 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 map obtained in, uh, without, without inhibition. So essentially what it's telling us is what the postsynaptic effects of dopamine are in this region of the brain. So a blue area here is an area where dopamine receptor inhibition dampened uh, the uh, bold response or damp dampened our estimate of neural population activity. The slight red that we see here is actually a slight enhancement of the bold response in this region here. And again, I think what you can see uh, pretty clearly here in particular is that the areas of peak dopamine release actually, if anything, line up with areas where uh, dopamine has a slightly depressing role on, on the net activity in this region. Uh, in other words, the postsynaptic activity here is actually, uh, uh, you know, kind of damped in the presence of dopamine with respect to, uh, 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 you know, uh, when dopamine, when postsynaptic signal by dopamine is allowed. And so, um, what, what we're uh, just to summarize that conclusion, we can see that peak dopamine release does not drive peak postsynaptic responses. Instead the postsynaptic responses that we see by normal fMRI are coming from something else. Uh, we don't know what that is, but, but they're coming from something else. Now, do you think that we can conclude that dopamine doesn't do anything much in this region of the brain? Of course not. Dopamine is well known to act in this region of the brain, and we're able to see some of that in these data as well. Uh, where we could see the greatest effect was by considering the time courses, the temporal dimensions, the temporal dimension that goes with those three-dimensional spatial maps that I've just been showing you. We could see a difference in the temporal profile of dopamine and of population bold activity uh, just by looking at the mean time courses of the two signals. This is from parallel acquired data. Um, but using exactly the same experimental paradigm. And you can see that the bold response, uh, that the, I'm sorry, the dopamine response to a stimulus, the stimulus is given during the gray bar here, is considerably briefer uh, than the bold response, which is prolonged over uh, a couple of minutes actually after uh, the stimulus is given. Um, so we could see that the dopamine is over faster than the bold response. Now, interestingly, if we block the postsynaptic response to dopamine uh, in this region of the brain, we actually gave now here a systemic dopamine blocker, dopamine receptor blocker, we actually recover a much shorter bold signal. So the red traces shown here in various striatal regions, nucleus accumbens, caudate putamen, and lateral septum, you can see that the bold responses without the drugs are always longer than the responses with the drugs. And in fact, the responses with the drugs have a time course that's actually pretty similar to what we see for dopamine alone. And what this suggests is that the dopamine, when it's released and acting on postsynaptic receptors, is prolonging the response to stimulation, prolonging the response that would be there anyway, but that um, is clearly modulated in this way by dopamine. We can see that in another way by computing an impulse response function. So this, show, this is a mathematical function that when convolved with the dopamine release profile gives the change in bold. And what you can see by looking at this is that in particular at the zero time point, meaning describing the instantaneous effects of dopamine on bold, that there's actually a relatively little effect of the dopamine on the amplitude 
of the bold signal at this time point. But in contrast, as we look at later time points, these are times in seconds, we see uh, a delayed response that reflects this uh, uh, effect of uh, kind of broadening the bold response when we get dopamine acting there. Uh, so we could get these data by comparing the dopamine map in three, we actually in four dimensions, spatially and temporally, with the bold data from the same region of the brain here. So to conclude um, uh, this uh, part of the uh, uh, finding, uh, you know, what we discovered is that dopamine is boosting postsynaptic response durations, but it has relatively little effect on the amplitudes. And that was, uh, the amplitude effect was on the previous slide. This is more focused on the uh, response durations. Um, so let's see. So that was all about how dopamine acts locally in the striatum to modulate rather than really cause um, uh, uh, bold signal responses, neural population activity responses in this region of the brain. What can we say about how dopamine release in the striatum affects the rest of the brain? So to look at this problem, we uh, combined brain-wide uh, bold imaging with our local imaging of dopamine in the striatum. And we first asked the question, well, could we find uh, regions of bold that seem to track the dopamine? And when I say track, what I mean is track temporally, meaning across each instance of the stimulation, also track over different stimulus parameters. So we applied the stimulation at three different amplitudes, and we, we figured that a region that is strongly influenced by dopamine in the striatum would tend to be modulated in the same way uh, by, uh, the, uh, 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 by the variation of dopamine in the, in the striatum. And so we addressed this using a sort of a GLM style analysis by pulling out um, a, a regression coefficient uh, that, uh, that indicates uh, the proportion of variance in the bold signal globally explained by the local dopamine. And what you can see, I think, by comparing uh, the uh, bold map that's just everything that comes from the stimulus uh, with um, this uh, uh, kind of dopamine tracking map over here, is that there are uh, what seem to be sort of hot spots of tracking. Uh, you know, up here you can see in motor cortex is an example over here. This is an area called the insula, uh, insular cortex, uh, where you can see this also. And um, the uh, kind of diffuse activation that we see uh, in the bold map alone is not as diffuse down here in the tracking map. We did a second experiment uh, to test um, uh, the extent to which we could attribute uh, these results, these, these uh, apparent dopamine-dependent modulations to dopamine uh, by adding the dopamine blocker uh, and looking globally now at where signals are modulated. And what I think you can see is that many of the same uh, kind of hotspots that show up in the dopamine tracking map also show up as strongly modulated by the dopamine blocker. Um, so here are a couple of examples here. I'm again pointing to the motor cortex and also this uh, insular cortex region here. There are also regions where we can see that neither the dopamine tracking nor the dopamine receptor blockade are, uh, are uh, having strong effects. So a, a, a really outstanding example is over here in the ventral striatum where we, we see a very strong uh, uh, net bulb response, but uh, much less tracking. Uh, over here in a region called cingulate cortex, we also see uh, comparatively little tracking and comparatively little dopamine receptor dependent modulation. So what this is telling us is that dopamine seems to have a role in modulating these long distance kind of activity relationships, specifically in motor and insular cortex, which are uh, respectively, of course, involved in motivated behavior and in emotion and uh, uh, kind of limbic processing. So we can't go much further than that. I think it's speculative to say that this apparent dopamine dependent modulation of these areas is the reason uh, why certain types of behavior take place. But I think it's quite suggestive of the role of dopamine release in the striatum in modulating these uh, kind of much more diffuse circuits 
uh, in the brain for uh, bringing about motivated behavior. I should say, by the way, um, as a technical note, that this experiment here was done um, using systemic dopamine blockade, but we also did a more causal manipulation of the local dopamine in the ventral striatum, and we got a very similar uh, pattern of modulation here. So I think this really is a causal effect of striatal dopamine release on, on um, broad uh, signal uh, uh, in multiple regions of the brain. Okay, um, so we're taking this work in a number of directions. So I think it didn't escape um, your uh, attention, or it may not have escaped your attention, that, uh, you know, of course, these experiments were done uh, with, uh, you know, an invasive stimulus, this uh, uh, lateral hypothalamic uh, uh, electrical stimulation. We want to be able to detect more subtle uh, stimuli in the brain and uh, that, that elicit dopamine, um, uh, that elicit dopamine release. And so, uh, we've put in quite a lot of effort into trying to make more sensitive uh, dopamine sensors. And we've got a, 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 you know, several projects in the lab that, that aim to do this, uh, largely focused on using uh, nanoparticles of various sorts or nanostructures of various sorts. And uh, one we published earlier this, uh, or I guess it was last year, uh, where we uh, 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 employed this uh, nanoparticle aggregation mechanism to uh, sense dopamine and we could create are two uh, dependent effects, so T2-dependent effects uh, due to dopamine that, uh, that require far less contrast agent and that might therefore provide um, considerably better sensitivity. Um, another direction uh, that we're uh, very interested in is trying to look, uh, uh, trying to use a, a basically a more photogenic uh, contrast agent de delivery scheme. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time actually uh, now uh, looking at ways uh, to deliver our probes uh, without jamming needles through the skull. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be getting human volunteers for our experiments right away, but maybe one day. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that I think is uh, pretty important actually to uh, many of the projects in our lab. Um, you can see here uh, work by Pete Harvey uh, that shows uh, a broad delivery of a, a, a T1 contrast agent uh, somewhat similar to the uh, dopamine uh, sensor uh, throughout uh, much of, uh, uh, of uh, in this case, I think it's, uh, yeah, this is a rat brain also. So um, these are a couple directions that we're taking this and hopefully we'll be able to make the technology better in addition to uh, using it to uh, uh, address a, a broader uh, set of biological situations where we're interested in how dopamine modulates uh, 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 information processing in the brain. All right, so just to summarize this part of the talk, um, I showed you that dopamine modulates uh, the duration of striatal responses to uh, reward evoked dopamine, uh, reward to, uh, I'm sorry, to rewarding stimulation. I showed you that distal regions, uh, activity in distal regions is modulated uh, by striatal dopamine, specifically in the motor and limbic regions. And then I showed you, uh, uh, or I, I discussed briefly at least, that, uh, that these results uh, could, be, uh, could reflect on human fMRI. And uh, you know, I, I talked specifically about interpretation of striatal dopamine uh, or, or, or striatal bold responses in terms of dopamine. But you could imagine that one could also try to come away with biomarkers for dopamine function that actually bring together uh, some of these distal effects uh, that we've identified in this study um, in, in human fMRI studies. All right, and then there are a few, few further directions that we're taking this work. So I'd like to switch gears now. Uh, we were talking about an MRI probe for sensing dopamine, and it basically addresses sort of what's schematized in this diagram here, namely the transfer, the flow of information or the, 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 the transition of signaling in dopamine uh, releasing cells, uh, schematized in orange, to postsynaptic circuit elements schematized here in red that uh, act both locally and globally. What about uh, integrating uh, the, uh, this dopamine input, which we know is not the only input to the striatum, with other inputs. Um, so, you know, here I've schematized some other arrows coming into this part of the brain here. We know that they're there because remember that when we block dopamine postsynaptically, we still get pretty strong bold responses in this region. So, um, our lab was very interested in this type of problem, and I'm going to talk about its um, application specifically again in striatal circuitry here. And to address the problem, we developed a probe that senses 
presynaptic input actually to any region of the brain in principle, but here we're, we're talking about the striatum. Um, now, the idea behind this type of probe is somewhat complex. Hopefully, you will find it interesting. Um, and the starting point um, for understanding what we did here is actually the consideration of the mechanisms behind the traditional bold fMRI response. So have a look at this picture over here. This is a diagram in very qualitative terms of the nonspecific neurovascular coupling that relates the activity of different types of cells in the brain. So they might be neurons or glia uh, to changes in blood flow that occur locally and that obviously give us the ability to map neural activity indirectly uh, at a, in a spatially and temporally resolved way. So we know that um, this coupling between cellular activity and uh, you know, changes in flow or changes in, in blood volume, you know, diameter of, of local vessels, that this involves a variety of coupling mechanisms, uh, uh, chemical molecules that are generated in cells and that act on the vasculature in a, in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail about all the ways, but you, some of you probably know about beautiful work by um, you know, David Atwell, Mike and Nadergaard, and you know, many other people um, who uh, have studied this. Now imagine that you had the ability not just to have this kind of nonspecific coupling, this nonspecific neurovascular coupling where you can't tell what cell triggered the local bold response. Imagine that instead of that, you had the ability to create an artificial signal that unites the activity uh, in individual uh, genetically targeted cells uh, to this postsynaptic response. Uh, you could achieve that kind of thing if you had the ability to do two things. First, you need to introduce an artificial signaling mechanism. It could be a flavor of one of the endogenous signaling mechanisms that that causes uh, uh, vasodilation activity dependent vasodilation, uh, or it could be a, a completely new type of approach. Um, you need to be able to do that, and that's what these little blue Pac-Men here are schematizing. The other thing you need to be able to do is to somehow get rid of the background bold response, the background sources of neurovascular coupling. And we do that by, uh, or we, we can imagine doing that at least, by uh, either just overwhelming the endogenous fMRI by subtracting it or by silencing it. Subtracting it meaning doing some kind of differential, uh, differential uh, uh, measurement or silencing it using some kind of inhibitory approach. Um, so this is a bioengineering technique where, where the idea is to create these probes that create or that uh, induce artificial hemodynamic responses. Um, and uh, uh, then, uh, you know, I'll tell you about how we did that and then how we apply them. And uh, I also want to just say very briefly the motivation for this slightly awkward approach, you know, where we're hijacking the endogenous mechanism rather than, you know, making the ideal, uh, you know, genetically encoded paramagnetic contrast agent. The reason for that is, is simply that, well, we tried and haven't yet succeeded uh, with uh, just sort of making a genetically encoded or a, a detectable version of a genetically encoded version of things like our dopamine sensor. All right, now how do we create these probes that hijack the hemodynamic response? Uh, we do that by engineering a protein called called NNOS, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, that is one of the dominant sources of hemodynamic contrast in fMRI or any of the related techniques that use blood flow-based measures of neural activity. Uh, we took NNOS and we swapped out its catalytic domain with the catalytic domain of a, of a close cousin, something called INOS or inducible nitric oxide synthase, um, so that we created this thing called nitric oxide synthase for targeting image contrast, or Gnostic. The Gnostic is just like NNOS in the sense that it is able to induce vascular contrast. It does that in an activity-dependent way because it's calcium sensitive, and calcium is one of the main endogenous signaling molecules uh, that bring about uh, uh, normal neurovascular coupling. And importantly, the Gnostic is distinguishable from NNOS-dependent endogenous fMRI signals 
by uh, using a special drug called 1400W that inhibits the Gnostic but has next to no effect on endogenous uh, hemodynamic responses. So these are the results down here from a cellular assay where we express either the Gnostic or the uh, wild type NNOS in cells. We stimulate the cells using a calcium ionophore, so it's sort of mimicking neural activity in a very loose sense. And we apply the drug, and what you can see is that the drug basically quashes the Gnostic dependent signal, whereas it has comparatively little effect on the endogenous, uh, uh, or the, what would be the endogenous signal. And we also tested this drug, and I'm, I don't have the data here to show you, but we also tested the drug in just sort of a canonical fMRI paradigm and showed that it has um, essentially no effect on uh, the, the normal fMRI signal due to sensory stimulation. All right, so Gnostics provide a means uh, for converting intracellular calcium dynamics into artificial kind of engineered fMRI signals, and they're genetically encoded. And that's what gives us the ability to do cool experiments with, that, with them. So um, to validate these things uh, in vivo, we began by taking the cells that express these probes and placing them into a rat brain so it's, a, it's, again, a pretty crude experiment. We just injected them in, and then we gave them stimulation with, uh, again, a calcium ionophore, something that sort of induces neural activity-like function of these cells in the presence or absence of the special drug that should enable us to quash their signals. And um, uh, when we did this, we actually saw what are uh, quite bright and clear fMRI responses to the stimulation in the area of the cells over here. And that's what, these are three different slices of rat brain uh, showing you this. And uh, we did the experiment also under two control conditions. So one is in the presence of the drug that's supposed to quash the signal. The signal goes away, uh, so it works uh, pretty well. And then we also did a control experiment with uh, cells that don't express the special probe, that don't express the Gnostic. And again, we can't see an fMRI response. So this shows that this special probe, the Gnostic, is able to induce artificial fMRI responses that can be uh, selectively uh, perturbed by this drug and therefore, uh, in principle, distinguished from uh, background activity. Okay, that's the validation of the technique. How can we use it? So we've only just started doing this, and so I'm gonna tell you about the results of the first experiments that we've done to uh, demonstrate circuit-specific fMRI using these Gnostics. And the way in which we use them to perform circuit-specific imaging is by packaging them into a retrograde viral tracer. So we encoded the Gnostic into a herpes simplex virus, an HSV, that when, uh, when it's injected at a particular place in the brain, gets taken up presynaptically and transported to cells that project to that region of the brain. And so in, in this way, you know, if we, indu you know, if we inject the, the vector into the striatum that's schematized in this uh, sagittal slice of a rat's brain here, it would get taken up and transported and expressed in these distal regions that all project to that region. Then we do two fMRI experiments. First, in the absence of the drug, then in the presence of the drug, the drug, remember, specifically inhibits the Gnostic. And so we get um, a data set that includes background fMRI plus the Gnostic signal, and then background fMRI only, and then we have to do a subtraction, and we get the different signal out of that. Now that may sound complicated, and indeed, we are trying to make it better so that we don't have to do a subtractive technique. However, we do get two things for the, the price of two, let's say, uh, here, in the sense that this experiment, when we perform it, tells us not only the Gnostic-specific fMRI signals, but also the nonspecific fMRI signals. And so that, um, that uh, joint kind of data acquisition can tell us uh, extra things about uh, how the brain works uh, you know, in this kind of context. Now, uh, in the experiments that I'm just gonna show you results from, uh, we introduced the virus into the striatum. We traced regions that are uh, projecting to the striatum, and we're giving that same rewarding stimulation, the lateral hypothalamic reward stimulus that we used in the previous study uh, with dopamine mapping. And we got these results. So here I'm showing you the different signal. 
So in other words, the uh, signal corresponding to this bottom region uh, only do, at least putatively, uh, to the Gnostic probe. And you can see that, again, they're sort of what appear to be hotspots. Now, in this case, the hotspots are coming from, at least in principle, physical expression of the probe in regions that are activated by the stimulus. So when we see regions like, um, again, insular cortex or motor cortex here lit up in this difference map, we can say that these are regions that are uh, sending input to the striatum, to the area where uh, the uh, virus was introduced during the rewarding uh, stimulation. Now, this is the first experiment of its kind. We don't expect it to be perfect. Uh, and to evaluate it, one of the uh, first things we did, of course, was a control experiment, where instead of encoding our Gnostic in the virus, we encode m cherry, which is a, a fluorescent protein that shouldn't do anything much. And uh, we just did exactly the same analysis. And in fact, you can see that um, although there are a few little blips in uh, this map, you know, I think reflecting imperfections in the data, um, there's actually, uh, you know, a much cleaner slate, very little uh, what appears to be selective activation um, in this, uh, in this control experiment here. We could do also ROI level analysis to determine where these uh, different, signal, uh, different signals are significant, where they're statistically significant. And in fact, in four regions of the rat's brain, the caudate putamen, entorhinal cortex, motor cortex, and substantia nigra, which is the main dopamine source to the striatum, we could find very consistent uh, different signals uh, when comparing the absence to presence of the, uh, this drug, this 1400W. So in other words, these are the most reliable areas where we're getting Gnostic dependent signal. They're therefore the, most, the areas that show uh, the most reliable evidence of specific input to the striatum during this reward paradigm. Uh, none of the regions that we looked at with M. cherry in the control condition showed significant differences at all. Um, and so uh, basically, again, to summarize, we see consistent signatures of striatal input uh, from diverse brain regions in, uh, you know, into, into the striatum. Um, because we got nonspecific fMRI data uh, in the same experiment, we can compare the circuit-specific measurements using the Gnostic with the nonspecific measurements that come just uh, in, in the presence of the, 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 the inhibitor that gets rid of the Gnostic signal. And we could ask a couple of questions. First, um, does, the, uh, does the activation uh, that we would see, you know, in, in, in background, as it were, does the endogenous nonspecific fMRI signal correlate closely uh, with, the, uh, with the Gnostic specific signal? Uh, we could ask that question. And um, uh, you know, in doing so, you know, we, we address, I guess, two things. I, I, I said, I guess it's really one question that lets us do two things. First, you know, we can assess whether uh, the uh, Gnostic signals are somehow just artifacts of having seen, let's say, bigger fMRI signals in those regions to begin with. And then the second thing is, it tells us something about whether, what the balance of presynaptic versus postsynaptic activity in each region is with respect to the striatum. And what you can see in this scatter plot of, I guess it's, uh, I think it's uh, eight different regions here, eight different uh, brain regions, um, is that in fact, there isn't uh, a clear evidence of correlation between the nonspecific fMRI and the Gnostic signal. And in particular, uh, there are a couple of regions over here, and I'll, I'll call your attention specifically to the CPU, caudate putamen and the motor cortex, that have the strongest presynaptic input, according to the Gnostic measure, to the striatum. But they also have some of the weakest nonspecific fMRI signals. So it really suggests that these regions provide a particularly strong balance of excitation to the striatum versus post, uh, 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 sorry, of presynaptic input to the striatum versus uh, uh, activity that's coming about through alternative pathways, perhaps postsynaptically. All right, so the takeaway from this is that uh, there are different uh, ratios of input to total activation in the different brain regions here. It tells us something about information flow.
Now, the second analysis that we did was to compare resting state measures of functional connectivity, which come specifically, of course, by just looking at correlations between uh, brain regions, but are often used to infer, uh, you know, some kind of causal relationship between the two regions. So we compare the resting state measure given by a correlation coefficient or a Fisher transformed correlation coefficient on the x-axis here with the Gnostic signal. Why does this make sense as a, car, as, a, as, a, uh, as a thing to do? Well, the Gnostic signal is also functional connectivity. It's actually, in principle, bona fide, hardwired functional connectivity because we're only seeing with this technique the signal from regions that are directly projecting through anatomically defined projections to the target region. And, and so we ask the question, well, how well do these two things line up? And again, the, quest, the answer is, well, not particularly well. So in particular, if we look at the, the four regions that show the strongest Gnostic signal, they are varying in terms of what the resting state correlations that they exhibit are. Uh, this is resting state correlation to the striatum. So again, we're sort of in both cases, we're kind of looking at, well, how close are these regions, functionally speaking, to the striatum? So what we see here is that resting state correlations do not match presynaptic strengths, at least in the paradigm we looked at, which was, of course, this reward stimulation paradigm. The answer might be different if we did a different experiment, but that's not what we did here. All right. Now, um, an obvious further thing to look at is the question of, well, how well do the functional signals that we discovered using the Gnostic approach line up with sheer anatomy? You know, in other words, are these areas that seem to project, that seem to be uh, uh, pulled out by this hemogenetic imaging, as we call it, uh, are these areas simply the areas that get the most, uh, that's, that, that sort of pick up the most tracer if we just inject an anatomical tracer? Uh, to presynaptic targets uh, to the striatum. And so we looked at that um, using uh, one of these brain clearing techniques of variance of clarity, which we uh, implemented in collaboration with uh, Kwang Hun Chung, uh, my colleague at MIT. And uh, uh, we also did conventional histology. And using those techniques, we uh, basically compared uh, uh, the staining of the various different regions with um, the uh, areas where we saw Gnostic fMRI signals. And we found that um, there was no area where we saw Gnostic signals that wasn't also stained, uh, but there were a couple of areas that were stained but didn't show activation. And it shows some, I think, the difference between just looking at anatomical connectivity and the kind of functional connectivity that we're trying to access with our experiments. Um, we also did a second thing, which was that we uh, validated our results using something called CFOS labeling, which is a histological technique that enables uh, the detection of activated cell populations. And um, I won't go into this in too much detail, but um, you know, suffice it to say that the uh, cells that look yellow here, and that uh, you know, many of them have arrowheads, are cells that, are, uh, that got, uh, got our virus uh, and that were also activated according to this CFOS measure. And we found these cells in each of the four regions that we got statistically significant uh, uh, hemogenetic imaging in, but not in other regions. Um, and so these are a couple of examples over here. All right, so um, the uh, CFOS and neuronal tracing confirmed our Gnostic measurements and showed that our results were consistent with anatomical connectivity. So taking all these data and stitching them together gives us what I think is, um, well, a crude, although somewhat exciting, I think, um, a picture of activity flow through uh, the rodent striatum. And um, this uh, little uh, uh, panel over here um, summarizes all the data that we got using our Gnostic approach, using nonspecific fMRI, using resting state analysis, and using just sheer anatomical labeling of ROIs. Um, the uh, darker or more saturated squares uh, indicate the areas where these various signals were stronger. stronger uh, and the less saturated colors are the areas where these signals were weaker. And I won't go through all this. Instead, I'll, seg I'll, I'll, I'll segue over to this diagram over here, which kind of summarizes all this stuff. And it shows in particular three different types of connections that we can see between brain regions and the striatum. And the three connections are 
the Gnostic signals, in other words, the presynaptic input that we could functionally image, um, the red uh, connections, which, um, you know, this is a region of the thalamus, the medial thalamus that projects strongly to striatum, but that didn't appear to be activated. This comes from the anatomical information that didn't get picked up by the Gnostic signal. And then these gray, uh, these gray connections here, which come from the functional connectivity analysis, and they show functional connectivity for regions that don't get pulled out by our kind of information flow mapping technique. It's tempting to say, okay, well, let's say S1, somatosensory cortex, maybe it's somehow getting postsynaptic information from the caudate, from the striatum where we inject the virus. We don't know that that's true, so there's no arrow on this, but probably in some cases, these regions are postsynaptic uh, to uh, the injection site over here. Um, this diagram, of course, is specific to the particular experiments that we did, uh, but it might be relevant to other contexts, and I think it'll, it'll take further work uh, to see how this generalizes um, uh, in, other, uh, you know, in other paradigms, uh, other stimulus paradigms around the striatum or other brain regions. So I want to, um, just in closing now, talk about the next steps uh, that we see for this circuit mapping technique. And I began by highlighting the problem of studying information flow around regions like this activated region. This is the fusiform face area, um, uh, the specific face responsive area uh, in the human brain. And uh, we'd like to understand where this is coming from uh, in more detail than current techniques allow. And we think that techniques like this uh, hemogenetic imaging, the use of the Gnostic probes could address that. And um, so of course, um, I'm not gonna find very many people who are willing to be uh, uh, pilot animals in our study of Gnostics in the human brain. Um, but, uh, but we are starting to work now uh, in collaboration with uh, Merganka Sur's lab and uh, uh, Bob Desimone's lab uh, and also with Nancy Kenwisher uh, at uh, a marmoset analog of the face recognition task that gave uh, this, uh, that gave these types of data. And so we're doing fMRI in marmosets where we think we really can uh, identify face specific regions and apply the Gnostic probe to uh, specifically functionally map the inputs that, uh, uh, you know, we know somehow give rise to face selectivity in these regions. So this is a, a, a pretty um, hot interest of ours right now. Um, the other uh, further direction that we're taking this work is uh, to improve the probes themselves. Now, uh, I mentioned that we have to do this kind of differential measurement technique, and of course we're trying to address that. Another, um, I think, pretty interesting direction is to try to make the probes multiplexable. So imagine if you could, um, you know, essentially light up or, 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 or selectively image two different types of, two different types of cells or two different circuit elements that both converge on the same region or perhaps that interact in, in multiple brain regions. So to create multiplexable uh, versions of our Gnostics, we made these drug-induced activatable Gnostics or diagnostics, no G. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have time to really talk about them in detail, but in each case, basically, there are proteins that are engineered so that in the presence of a drug, they're active, but not in the absence. And we have a, an initial set of these things, and the drugs, uh, which bring about the form of dimerization, they create, um, you know, pretty big changes in the activity uh, measured through an assay of various variants of, of these probes that we created. All right. Um, so uh, let me uh, summarize uh, the second part of my talk here. Gnostics permit brain-wide functional imaging of genetically targeted cells and circuit components. I showed, of course, the application to circuit components here, uh, but uh, you could imagine hooking this thing up behind promoters specific to, let's say, dopaminergic cells or GABAergic cells and so on and doing uh, analogs of the experiment that I showed you. Um, we, we could see diverse inputs to the striatum and do a form of information flow mapping around the striatum, you know, with some specific results that I uh, highlighted along the way. Um, and we could differentiate these sites from, let's say, purely anatomical connections or purely correlative uh, connections that came from a resting state fMRI analysis. Um, there are many opportunities for further development, and if any of you is interested in this, please come talk to me because there's um, actually quite a lot to do. <laughs>
Um, so I'd like to uh, now uh, wrap up just by thanking the people who uh, did all this work and many people uh, from our lab have contributed along with collaborators uh, with Kwang Hun Chung, uh, Bob Desimone, and uh, Raganka Sir. Um, but I'd like to call particular attention uh, to Nan Lee, who actually led or co-led both of the two major projects that I told you about. So she is uh, one of two authors on the paper describing um, the uh, uh, local and global consequences of dopamine release. Um, and she is co-first author with Suparno Ghosh, who's also done an amazing, uh, 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 you know, uh, set, of, uh, uh, set of work um, on the invention and the, the uh, validation and initial application of these Gnostic tools. Uh, so big thanks, especially to Nan and Suparno, but also to everybody else who contributed and funding from these organizations here. Thank you for your attention. And I guess we'll stop to take questions now.